So in this session, we're going to look at the competencies required to be a learning and development or training and development professional. You'd be surprised. How we can leverage social media platforms for training purposes. Oh yeah, micro learning. And we'll have a good look at some immersive environments, okay? So let's say you want to be a training and development professional. Now, most people go into this program and you shouldn't know at this point. You might, but you shouldn't know what you might want to specialize in. Some of you do. Some of you have already developed a passion for, let's say, health and safety, and you want to totally go right into it. Not general HR, but something specific, a specialty. Some of you might like comp or benefits, labor relations. Maybe, hopefully, HRIS, huh? But some of you, I hope, in the two training courses in this program, the first TND course and this e-learning course, some of you, I hope, have been bitten by the TND bug and you might want to get into it. Now, here's the truth. I'll tell you the honest truth. Training and development jobs at the entry level to start with, they're really not advertised. They're, they're very rare. More senior ones are, yes. Okay, you can see those. But how do you get in then? Well, let me tell you, it's how you get into any specialty in any profession. First of all, get a degree that teaches you it. Unfortunately, it's not that easy for training. So the next best thing you could do is make yourself, your brand, look like a training person. Or if it's health and safety, make yourself look like a health and safety person or an HRIS person. So when somebody looks at your resume and they see all these things that nobody else has, these things that are specific to this specialty training, their eyes light up. They say, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, okay, this person's good. You sure we can hire them as a generalist? But then we can get them into the training side of it because they know more than the next person. They're able to talk about it, especially during an interview. Now, quite often what happens is you do get hired as a generalist. And then because you're displaying more characteristics of being a training person, you can weasel your way in. That's a good word. Maneuver your way in into the training department. And if you don't have a training department, guess what? You become the generalist who handles training stuff. I don't mean the administration of training. That's easy. That anybody could do. Keeping track of who did what, the costs, enrollments. I'm talking about developing this stuff, okay? Being the architect of it. Now, I got to tell you, much of this is free. If you want to align yourself and look like a training person, it doesn't have to cost you much. The first course you took in training development, that was a start. It doesn't make you an expert. This course is exposing you to the, the beginnings of training technologies and digital training. That's good. Now, hang on. Let's go backwards. There is a master's degree at University of British Columbia, master's in digital learning. Uh, in fact, you can leave when you finish this BCom, HST, when you leave, it's very good potential that UBC, University of British Columbia, will take you into that master's program. We actually had a student do that out of HST. She went and she did it. It was online. She did it. She's got an awesome job right now with the government, and she loves it. So here's what you need. These are the competencies required of being a training and development professional. First of all, there's a document called the Training Competency Architecture, TCA. They renamed it now to the TBOC, which is the Training Book of Competencies, or TBOC, Training Book of Knowledge. And you can download this stuff. I want you to go through it. I'm not saying memorize it, but know the various sections of competencies they require knowledge in. But then you also need to be creative. You need to have a sense of creativity. You cannot be a training and development professional other than on the administration side, keeping track of, okay? You can be one of those. But you can't be a developer without being creative. Likely, I can say you cannot be an artist without being creative, and you cannot be a Hollywood producer or director without being creative. So creativity is within, right? You decide what your creativity is. Can you see things? Can you look at things and put something together that is meaningful and people will appreciate? Can you use emotions to your advantage? Are you articulate? 
articulation or an articulate nature means can you look at details? Are you that kind of person who could see every little corner of something and given enough time, tweak it, fine tune it? I think you all are, most of you anyways. Do you have an understanding of pedagogy or andragogy? And you know, listen, I, I invented a word called andragogy. I'm getting in trouble for it. But I've been using it for 10 years, so now it's a word, okay? Call Webster's Dictionary and have it added, please. So the technical industry term is pedagogy. But peda means children. Andra means adults. So I think we're, we're dealing with adults here. We're developing for adults. And, and andragogy or pedagogy is that whole process, that magical process, where you realize how communication, that which needs to be learned, that's in your hands, how can that be placed effectively in the brain of the learner to develop that competency? How? How can you do it? If you can figure out how to do that effectively, then you're going to be a genius. In fact, there are geniuses in the training space right now. They figured out the andragogy. And I've taught you quite a bit as well. In fact, your builds, the way you're building your e-learning is respecting a lot of that. You know your audience. That's why I ask you to write a description of your audience, a detailed one. Now, you also need to know Universal Instructional Design, UID. We went over that. Bloom's Taxonomy, of course. Elements of AOTA for accessibility. Those are not difficult things to learn. And then the key is you need to have working knowledge of course management systems or learning management systems. So we've already started with Course Sites Blackboard, Udemy, Adobe Captivate. I could throw uh, Articulate Storyline in there. We've explored um, uh, some object design using Powtoons and Vokies and Pixton. Okay, many of you might explore even more. Now, if you want to specialize in TND, you want to build that profile, you are not just going to build your e-learning for my assignment on one platform. You're going to build it on all three, even at the most basic level. But then over the months in the future, you're going to learn more and more and more and more about it. Thank God there's a lot of videos out there, right? You can watch. It doesn't have to cost you a penny. We haven't spent money in this course so far, and we have access to a lot of stuff. Now, you should have some knowledge of graphics, okay? Like what I'm referring to is Photoshop, for example. You know, you don't have to be an expert in it because when you're a learning development professional, we can hire experts that know graphics. But if you are better at graphics than anybody else, you can save money. You can be more agile and pivotal when your need arises to make your own graphics, manipulate them. But I think at the least, for example, if you can go to... PowerPoint, for example. And if you put an image in it, it has a white kind of background and you could make it transparent or change the contrast on the image. I mean, as a minimum, you understand some graphics, right? Cut, paste, insert, overlay. That's okay. Web design, that's always a must. Listen, I believe people who can design websites, and I don't mean raw coding of HTML. I'm talking using Wix or WordPress, where you drag and drop things. And that's one of the reasons I'm asking you to do your portfolio on Wix or WordPress, because it's going to give you that exposure to design, flow, design elements, user-friendliness. Because when you could do that through web design, you're understanding how e-learning can be built. Now, look, I'm going to throw Excel in there because I throw it in everywhere. Your knowledge of Excel, obviously, is going to help you everywhere. Just to keep track of the data, maybe to keep track of your project timelines. And it never hurts to have project management skills. Now, you're one of the only programs who's taking project management as a course. You already took it. But maybe consider getting certified in it, PMP or something like that, right? Not a necessity, but it just looks awesome on your resume. See, that's how you start to build your profile. And there's a lot more. But when you get through this, you say, I'm going to add one more, some more knowledge on something else, like Desire to Learn or WebCT, other platforms. Now, one quick way to get there is to add credibility. And you get instant credibility in a profession by getting certified. Now, there's some certifications like CHRP that 
you know, tons of people have. They're very basic type of exams you write. It just proves that you went through it and other people didn't. The meaning might not be there, but certifications at the specialty level, like the health and safety certification or the benefit certification, those are much more meaningful. So take this one, for example, the CTP or CTDP. That's the biggest one in the land. It really is. There's some smaller ones. If you look at my blog, you can see a list that cost a bit more money, but you just get some letters next to your name. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But this one, the Institute for Performance and Learning, IPL, which used to be called the Canadian Society for Training and Development, and yes, there's an American one called ASTD, what they do is they offer you to get certified. And their certification, I love it. It's great. It's portfolio-based. They want you to show the work you've done, not just pass a multiple-choice exam, although there might be one of those as well. And when you get the letter CTP, Certified Training Practitioner or Professional, and then Certified Training Development Professional, industry pays attention. I mean, these are things that show up on your LinkedIn search. People find you. They come to you. In fact, look, I'll give you an example. Years ago, there was a large consulting firm, starts with the K, KPMG. This is about eight, nine years ago. And they were looking for a national director of learning and organizational development. So the head of training, so to speak, for the whole company, thousands, tens of thousands of people. And the job was 200000 plus dollars. And they, they spent pretty much a year looking for somebody. And it wasn't like there aren't people out there wanting to do it. There are, but they're already working. And it was hard to find somebody at that level who's a strategist, who's an architect, who can see the big picture and have an army, an army of developers working for them to develop learning with the right andragogical impact. See, that would be you. You'd be part of that army, and then you could take on that director role. Now let's move to social media. I think you all know what social media is. And in fact, I asked the class in the live session, I go, what do you want? And Twitter, you're not on, okay? We've proven that before. Twitter's great. You know what Twitter is. Even if you have a Twitter account, doesn't mean you follow it all the time. And I'm one of them. I'll go to Twitter once every month. I'm not a Twitter person. I have a Facebook account. I have several of them. I can leverage it. I'm not an active participant in it. And then you would say something like, uh, not Pinterest, what's the Instagram is another one, right? YouTube is also social media. These are just platforms where you have users, you have people who follow, followers, who when you post something, it goes to their device, their phone, their computer. And you have to believe that there are many people who are glued to it. Their minds are there. Their attention is there. And the idea of good communication, good tr training, is to be where the person's mind is. So the idea of micro-learning comes up. Okay, look, if you offer a training program, a training course, and people finish it, it's done, it's over. You, we, we all know, you know perfectly well, you forget stuff. But then if they're part of your Facebook group or your Instagram group for your company, your department, why not send them carefully curated, scheduled, reminders, little snippets of key knowledge from the training that you just finished. Nothing big, you know, sentence or two, an image, a meme, the uh, TikTok, I don't care. But once in a while, not every day, every three days or once a week, and they get this nice reminder and they read it, and their brain automatically says, hey, I can associate that with that training course. And when that happens, they actually tend to use it. So it offers the idea of repetition and reminders so they can recall and apply. And maybe that one day they'll put two and two together at the right time at the right place and actually synthesize, come up with something new, innovate. So not a lot of work has been done on micro-learning, but I think any one of you could use this as a strategy, even just write it up for your own project for my course, but also in real life consider how you can leverage existing technology called social media to extend a message outwards to the users. And like I said, don't just put it out on Twitter and force people to be on Twitter. If they're not actually going to look at it, there's no point. It's a checkbox. You check it off. I did it. That's not good enough. Did you do it? And it didn't have any impact. 
If it had impact, you were successful with it, right? Now, somewhat related to that, there's this whole idea of micro credentials that I'm gonna I'm gonna mention. I, I like this actually. It's it's not emerging. It's been around for a few years, but it's kicking up speed or or picking up speed. Sorry. So what a micro credential is is not a full on course. You know, people might shy away from a a ten week or four week course or one year course, yet they want to gain some skills. I mean, come on, I could ask any of you, have you ever taken a course where you say, I wish they just got right to that thing and that's all I needed to know? So what a micro-credential does is just do exactly that. Give you that one little tiny piece. Get you to become good at it, go through it. Might only be a day or two days or a week. And when you finish, you get what we call a badge, a digital badge or little certificate. Now, if you don't know what a badge is, please go out and Google I need you all to go and get some badges, okay? Badges are awesome. They're these little tiny sets of knowledge you pick up and you get a badge. And the badge is electronic. It's a picture like the one you're looking at down there. Each one is a badge. But it also has a digital code so nobody else can fake it. And a lot of times you can transmit those directly into your LinkedIn. Certainly put them in your, your website, your blog. And people pay attention. They say, oh, this person has all these micro badges. I was looking for a whole degree in something. Wow. But this person has enhanced that with the badge in Wemis and AOTA, a badge on working at heights, a badge on um, uh, conflict resolution, a badge on change management. So please start Googling. If you go to eCampus Ontario, so that's the letter E Campus Ontario, they're really experimenting with a lot of badges for free that you can pick up. It's a little breather for you as well, just to move away from regular education. I'm developing a badge at Seneca for Tableau. I want to develop a badge for Talio. I'd love to give you a badge, one badge for each, you know, one for course sites, one for Udemy, one for, let's say, Adobe Captivate. We're not there yet. But wouldn't it be nice to honor you and acknowledge your achievement of learning a smaller skill? If it was Excel, I'd give you a badge to master pivots, for example. A badge to become really good at VLOOKUPs, macros, whatever, it might, charts. So keep an eye open for badges, but as a learning and development professional, ask yourself, how can I leverage this? Right? There's already organizations out there, Microsoft, Google, for example, who manage badges for you. They're called digital wallets. They can do that for you. You just have to design the picture. But imagine employees get a series of badges for doing things. It's an enticement. It's a reward. And maybe if you get five badges in a cluster, you can get a certificate or something like that, a promotion, I don't know. Now, I want to get to this. I've been itching to get to this. It's called immersive environments or gamification. Now, you're a generation that gets gamification. You know what games are. You like games. In fact, if I put you in a training session with no games versus a training session that had the games, you'd probably say more good things about the one that had games because games offer interactivity, a change, a diversion. Now, gamification in general could be as simple as some little objects in your e-learning. For example, you put a digital Jeopardy game or a crossword puzzle or, you know, the ones where you click on images to find the right thing and maybe there's points involved. It could be a Kahoot. There's a lot of objects out there that you can use to develop these little games for you. But then on the other flip side, you can have immersive games, something like uh, World of War or Halo or Roblox, if anybody's heard of Roblox or uh, Minecraft, where you're actually an avatar, a character who sets foot inside a space which I'd like to say is imaginary, but it's not. You're looking at it. It's on your screen. And you, you move around this space, and you either build things, you get things, you collect things, you destroy things. Whatever the andragogical impact is, what is it you're trying to do? Are you trying to get five people on a team to work together, to climb a mountain, to build something? See, there's the value. You are now developing teamwork competencies or you're developing 
um, visual skills or you're developing skills related to stress or time management. Now, there's a lot of tools out there you can use to do that. We're going to look at one shortly. But there's a company called TELUS, right? TELUS, you've heard of them, phones, cell phones. They also have a huge insurance side, huge, billions of dollars. And they spent so much money on gamification, they created their own internal kind of reality world, so to speak. By the way, just on a side note, there's a, a Rob, R-O-B-L-O-X, Roblox. There's um, a side app called Roblox Studio. If you know any young people, like six years old and older, and you want to really develop some coding skills without actually raw programming, get them into Roblox Studio. It's free, but it teaches them about sequencing and logic, creative, layering, innovating in a, in a way. And they walk away with this awesome knowledge of how to put things together. That's, that's coding, by the way. Sequencing, logic. And they would become very good learning and development professionals, to be frank. Now, other types of immersive environments are like virtual reality, like this lady in the picture wearing a headset. I don't know if you've ever been in a VR environment. If you haven't, listen, when the, the campus opens up, I want to put you on a, I want to put a headset on you, Oculus Go headset, and then I'll show you what's inside. Okay, that was my plan if we were in a classroom this summer. Now, what happens when you're in the virtual reality environment is something awesome, okay? First of all, your senses, your sense of hearing, maybe even your sense of smell, I don't know, but certainly your visual, your sight, they baseline. They get neutralized because you're in that space. And everything that you see inside is bringing you into a world that is not around you. In fact, it's so good, I can give you an anecdote. I was sitting in my office and I shared that with somebody and I was so into this VR baseline that a guy snuck up behind me and scared, tried to scare the heck out of me. But you know what happened? My brain did not acknowledge that loud noise behind me. I heard it, but it didn't acknowledge it. It didn't get affected by it. Now, because my mind, my brain was baseline and my, my complete attention was focused inside VR, I can now put imagery, messages in that VR that will implant into my brain much better for recollection and retention. It deep right inside the brain, deep psychology. And the hope is, and studies are not out yet on this, but the hope is that it will actually allow people to soak up communication, soak up the learning a lot better than just physical, traditional means. Because it's, it's um, multi-sensory. Now, the problem with VR is, of course, cost. Second is not everybody can stand VR. If you ever put a headset on, you can go to one of these malls, right? Or the storefronts where you pay, I think it's $20 for 30 minutes. Go try it if you can, after social distancing is over. But some people can only be in there for like two, three minutes and they feel nauseated. I'm no people who can be on it for two hours and they're okay. People watch movies on this thing. I think that's silly. But when you design VR, the stuff I'm doing, we design it for 10 to 15 minute segments. So we didn't get a chance to dabble in VR production. I get it. If you want to have a look at some of the stuff I produced, so not in a VR headset, obviously, but on the computer, Go look at my blog, the WordPress blog, and I have a whole list of them, okay? Now, getting back to that environment where you're actually walking into a space as an avatar, as a character, the immersive environment, there's one out there. It's been around for a long time, and it's free. It's called Second Life. And I'm going to give you a little tour of Second Life. So I'll just insert the video I already recorded. And Seneca College actually purchased land using what we call Linden dollars. So it's U.S. dollars you buy these fake dollars with, and they let you buy this land. I mean, it's not real land, but some guy owns a space, so you have to buy it. And we, we, we bought an island, actually, years ago. We kind of abandoned it. Maybe we should bring it back up. Maybe it'll be worthwhile for helping learners at a distant, in a distant environment. Maybe. 
why don't you look at it, our island, and then maybe write on your blog about how Seneca could do this in the fall. I don't know. Maybe we will. But the island is there. It's got several buildings on it. And the idea is students could go in, meet the professor and other students. It's just their avatar. But you know that you're next to somebody you know. And you could chat or use your voice. You can watch the video. You can have a discussion. That just might be the entertaining thing that will allow people to experience distance education in a whole different way. Okay, So have a look at the video, and I'll just end off with that. So hopefully you'll kind of take some time to discover and explore. Uh, certainly if you want to specialize in learning and development, the, the, the good part is this is fun. Right? Explore as many tools as you can. Dabble yourself in it, no pun intended, but immer immerse yourself in it. Now, if anybody wants to come around later and ask about virtual reality, I'm more than happy to show you, but we just have to wait till things open up, okay? If you want to get involved, I'll show you all the camera equipment, how to produce it. Maybe it'll be a thing for you, right? So have a look at these things.